Okay, so as many of you know, I grew up in more of farm country, <laughs> in the farmlands. And so growing up in that area, you see some pretty interesting forms of entertainment. We would have local fairs, and the fairs would be a place you could sell the animals or have games and eat interesting, they deep fry all sorts of interesting things that you can eat. <laughs> But some of the fairs, they'd have what's called a greased pig contest. Anybody ever heard of a greased pig contest? Probably Benjamin. Yeah, that's a Pennsylvania thing, maybe. What is a greased pig contest? You get a bunch of people into a closed area. It's a fenced off area. And you grease up a pig, <laughs> put grease on the pig. And then it's a contest to see who can grab and pick up the pig first. It's a very difficult thing. Picking up anything that's greasy is hard, but a pig that's moving and greasy is very slippery. You try to squeeze them hard and pick them up, but then he just slips out of your hands and runs away. So I don't know if it's appropriate to compare the early church to a greased pig. <laughs> But I get this picture of, of the early church of people trying to get a hold of it, <laughs> trying to capture it, hold it down, and the church just keeps slipping away from them, those that try to do it harm. And it's interesting when you look at all of church history, not just the early church, but it seems like the harder people tried to grab it and contain it, the more it grew, the faster it grew. The churches kept slipping out of the hands of the persecutors. The churches can't be contained by human hands. We see this even today, right? The fastest growing churches in the world are in countries that are trying to hold it down, contain it, repress it. Obviously, we think of China. But there's actually two other countries that hold the two fastest churching, growing churches in the world. You guys have any idea where are the fastest growing churches? Number one and number two? Any guesses? Russia? That's a good guess, but no. Number one is Iran, and number two is Afghanistan. And Afghanistan's growing because of the influence of Iran. I want to read to you some articles, because I know how translators love to translate read articles. But uh, an article, this is from the gospelcoalition.org. This was from April 2021. I'll try to paraphrase it. But he's talking about what's happening in, in Iran with the church. So obviously, the Iranian Revolution of 1979, that's when the Shah fell. There was a hard Islamic regime, right? It was under Islamic control. So he writes, over the next two decades, Christians faced increasing opposition and persecution. All the missionaries were kicked out. Evangelism was outlawed. Bibles in, in Persian and Farsi were banned, and it was soon hard to find them. And there were even some pastors that were killed at that time. He writes that the church came under tremendous pressure and many feared that it would soon wither away and die. But the exact opposite happened. In the last 20 years, more Iranians have become Christians than in the previous 13 centuries. That's since Islam came to power in Iran. In 1979, there were an estimated 500 Christians from a Muslim background in Iran. Today, there are hundreds of thousands and some estimate one million Christians in Iran. According to the, the organization Operation World, Iran has the fastest growing evangelical movement in the world. And the second fastest growing church is Afghanistan, where Afghans are being reached 
a lot of a lot in part by Iranian Christians. Now I'll just read something else from persecution.org. This is an article from July of this year. Again, he talks about the persecution of the church in Iran. And he says, persecution threatened to eliminate Christianity from Iran. However, the opposite happened. Persecution only seemed to spur the growth of the church. What we understand from the early church and from the modern church is that the church cannot be contained. And so as we look at Acts, and we're going to go back to Acts chapters 4 and 5, we see this early church, people trying to contain it, but it's impossible to do. Like I said, we're going to look at chapters 4 and 5 together. And so today's going to be the second sermon based on these two chapters. The reason we're looking at them together is because they cover similar events, two different events, but similar the apostles were arrested in both of these chapters for preaching the gospel. And so we're going to, like I said, we're going to jump a little bit between chapters, although last time I stayed mostly in chapter 4. Today I'm going to stay mostly in 4, go a little bit in the 5. But what we see in these early chapters is the early church was growing. It was growing fast. And the Jewish leader, leaders didn't like it. So they tried to contain it. They tried to contain the growth of the church. And specifically, they were trying to contain and stop the name of Yeshua from spreading. They were trying to contain the name of Yeshua. We talked about that last time. We talked about the name of Yeshua. And in these early chapters, we saw that there was an emphasis on his very name. For example, we saw Peter healed the lame man in Yeshua's name. When Peter stood on trial before the Sanhedrin, their question in chapter 4, verse 7, they asked him, by what name have you done this? And we also saw last time in verse 12, we saw that salvation only comes through Yeshua's name. And we also said his name simply represents him. When we talk about his name, it represents Yeshua. It refers to his person, to his authority, and sometimes to what he's accomplished, specifically what he's done on the cross. And last time we looked at how Peter and the apostles wanted to make Yeshua's name known. In verse 10, he says to the religious council, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel. He wanted them to know who Yeshua is. So today we're going to look at the other side, the opposition to the name. Those that wanted to contain his name and not let it spread any further. The apostles were trying to make Yeshua's name known, known to other people. And at the same time, there were other people trying to contain his name, stop it from spreading, to prevent his name from being known by others. Let's start in Acts 4, and we'll read verses 1 to 3. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. So this is Peter uh, speaking, and this is the reaction. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. First thing I want us to realize is that the church, and when I say the church, I'm talking about not just local churches, but all of Christianity. The church faces an enemy. And the enemy doesn't want the church to grow. The enemy, again, wants to contain the growth of the church. Who's the enemy of the church? When we say enemy, who do we think of? Think of Satan, number one, right? He's the number one enemy of the church. He's the enemy that he's the enemy of God, and he hates to see Yeshua's name go any further than what it's gone. 
He doesn't want any more believers in Yeshua's name. But there's another enemy of the church. And I would say the enemy of the church is any human being who opposes Yeshua's name is an enemy of the church. For the apostles here in Acts, the enemy, I think it's fair to say, the enemy of the church at that time were the Sadducees. Paul said it this way in Romans eleven twenty eight, Romans 11, verse 28. He says, as concerning the gospel, they, and they is referring to unbelieving Jews, are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. So realize it's saying a positive and a negative thing here about the Jewish people. It's reminding us that there's a glorious future that's waiting for the nation of Israel. So he says they're beloved for the Father's sake. They have been elected to a certain future. But at the same time, this verse reminds us that currently many Jews oppose the gospel. They want to contain the spread of Yeshua's name. And therefore, he calls them enemies of God, enemies of the cause of the gospel. So the enemy of the early church were really those religious leaders of Israel. But Luke highlights one specific group of all the religious leaders. Acts 4, verse 1, he highlights the Sadducees. We see it's the Sadducees specifically that came to them. Who were the Sadducees? You know, there's different political parties in Israel. Who were the Sadducees? So at that time, most of the priests were Sadducees. And they also made up a part of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the religious council that had Sadducees plus the Pharisees plus scribes and doctors. So the Sadducees also were part of that governing religious body. What did they believe? Because we need to understand what they believed to understand why these apostles upset them so much. <laughs> they believed only that the Torah, that the first five, first, first five books of the Bible were really the word of God. They wouldn't even consider the prophets as much as authority. So what does that mean? It means they rejected any type of resurrection because... According to them, they couldn't find any proof of the resurrection in the Torah, even though we see that Yeshua proved to them that it is in there. But for them, they said there's no resurrection because we don't see it in the Torah. That's what we believe. When it comes to the Messiah and the future of the Messianic kingdom, they thought of those things as kind of an ideal standard that was going to come, kind of a process that the world would go through. But they didn't see it as like a definite person coming at a definite time to be a definite event. It was all kind of like these are things that are going to gradually improve. And the third thing is they push for the status quo. You know what status quo means? It means let's keep everything the way it is right now. Let's not change anything. They were happy just the way everything was. They liked their religious system that had been in place for many years. They didn't want that to change, and they were okay with cooperating with the Roman Empire as long as that meant that nothing changed, if it helped keep the status quo. So we can see pretty quickly why they became the enemies of the apostles because of what the apostles preached. It went against everything that they believed and that they held, held dear. The apostles preached about Yeshua's resurrection. And the Sadducees denied any type of resurrection. The apostles proclaimed Yeshua as the Messiah, as a definite person that came to be the Messiah. That he was a real person that came at a real time. But the Sadducees didn't believe this. And finally, what the apostles preached was definitely a threat to the status quo. They preached something that went against and what could have disrupted the current situation. Not only did all that bother the Sadducees, but realize that Peter and John, they were kind of unauthorized teachers. 
In verse 13, look at verse 13. They call Peter and John unlearned and ignorant men in verse 13. It doesn't mean that he's not calling Peter and John stupid or illiterate. It means that they weren't trained by a reputable rabbi to teach the ways to teach the Jews. They lacked training and they didn't, they didn't view them as having the authority to teach. So all of this was against the status quo of the Sadducees. And also the, the Messiah they preached about, remember the Messiah, if it was going to be a real person, he was going to be a king. That also was a threat to the status quo. We like Rome and we don't want to make Rome upset. If we make Rome upset, then everything's destroyed. So all of these things together made the Sadducees not just nervous, but disturbed. <laughs> you guys know what the word disturbed means? Look, look in verse 2. That's the word that Luke uses. We have grieved in English. But it says the Sadducees were grieved or disturbed, greatly disturbed is what it means. That the apostles taught the people and preached through Yeshua the resurrection from the dead. By preaching about Yeshua, by trying to make his name known to the people, the apostles grieved the enemy. And we need to realize this about our own enemies today, the enemies of the church, the enemies of the gospel. Any human being that tries to prevent the spread of Yeshua's name is going to be grieved when we preach about Yeshua. So we need to be prepared for that. Prepare for the resistance. When we preach the gospel, people are going to be grieved that don't want it to be preached. They're going to be disturbed, greatly disturbed. But when we're a faithful witness for Yeshua, we should expect this to have a negative impact on certain people, for them to be grieved. We know there's a lot of modern-day religious Jews that are grieved just by hearing the name of Yeshua. They degrade or downplay Yeshua's very name. What do, what do they call Yeshua? Yeshu. Do you guys understand what Yeshu means? It's not, just, it's not just a nickname or a shortened version of Yeshua. It's an acronym that means Imchak Shmo Vazichro. It's an old Jewish curse, is what it is. They're not just shortening the name Yeshua, they're actually cursing. And it comes from Deuteronomy 25, 19 and Exodus 17, 14, where it talks about erasing the remembrance of Amalek. Remember the nation Amalek that was always the enemy of Israel? They say, let's, let's, let's make sure that people don't even remember Amalek anymore. And then later on, the Jews applied this curse to Haman during Purim. We know how we try to erase the name of Haman. This is how a lot of religious Jews feel about the name of Yeshua. Let it forever be erased that his, his memory will be forgotten. You know, we say when somebody dies in Israel, they say, may their memory be a blessing. For Yeshua, they want his memory to be erased. That's the type of enemy we're dealing with in this specific country. Preaching about the name of Yeshua will grieve the enemies of the gospel. And the apostles, by preaching about Yeshua, grieved the Sadducees. So when we do that today, we need to expect a similar response. Not only that they'll be grieved, but they might even threaten us as a result. We see threats here in Acts chapter 4. Last week we looked at verses 8 to 12. We saw Peter give another sermon. And after that, we see how these Sadducees who were grieved, it wasn't enough just for them to be disturbed, but they wanted to harm these apostles. They wanted to threaten them that they would no longer speak. And so we see that in verses 13 to 22. Let's read that passage, 13 to 22. Uh, Acts 4. So Peter, I just preached this message. And so the Sanhedrin and the Sadducees primarily says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled 
And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was about 40 years old, on whom this miracle of healing was showed. I first want to say that what happens here is an exact fulfillment of Yeshua's words in Luke 21. Back in Luke 21, Yeshua prophesied that the apostles would be persecuted. And he explains why they would be persecuted. He says specifically in Luke 21, verse 12, that he, they would be persecuted for my name's sake. They would be persecuted because of Yeshua's very name, because of their association with Yeshua's name. Again, the focus is on his name. The enemy's desire is to persecute us for the sake of Yeshua's name. But notice that the rest of Yeshua's prophecy in Luke 21 also came true. He promised to turn that persecution into a testimony. And he promised that the Holy Spirit would be the one to give them the words to speak. And that's exactly what we see in verse 8. When Peter gave his sermon, it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so as Peter preaches filled with the Holy Spirit, this, the impression from this Holy Spirit-filled sermon is what we just read in verses 13 to 18. Instead of being moved by it, the Sanhedrin was afraid of Yeshua's name spreading. That's what we read in verses 17 and 18. Let it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Yeshua. They knew that Yeshua's name was spreading and spreading quickly. And they, again, they wanted to contain that spread. That it spread no further among the people. What does the enemy try to do to contain the church? They make threats. That's all they can do. They make threats. Let us straightly threaten them is what it says in verse 17. Let's try to intimidate them. Let's try to make them afraid to speak at all nor teach in the name of Yeshua. The enemy wants to contain that name of Yeshua. And they do it through threats, but there's a problem for them. The problem is that name cannot be contained. We see this in two verses. We see that there was no way to contain the name of Yeshua. First, we see it in verse 4. In chapter 4, verse 4. What happened after the sermon of Peter, that first sermon from chapter 3? It says, how be it? That means that's contrasting. It said that in verse 3, it says the, the Sanhedrin, they, they took a hold of them, they put them in jail. How be it? Saying, well, no matter what they tried to do, how be it? Many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. This doesn't mean that and some people disagree, but based on what's, what's written here, it means that the total number of believers was now up to 5,000. But it means that the church was growing. More and more people believed in Yeshua. And this grieved the Sadducees. It disturbed them. Think about the percentage of Jews in Jerusalem that were now believers. Let's think, let's think in percentages. <laughs> So they estimate there was about 25,000 to 85,000 Jews in Jerusalem at that time. I know that's a, a kind of a big range, but that's, they don't know for sure. Between, between 25,000 and 85,000 in Jerusalem. 
that. So if 5,000 of them are now believers in Yeshua, that means of everybody living in that area of Jerusalem, 6 to 20% of them are now believers in Yeshua. No wonder the Sadducees were grieved and worried that the status quo would be broken. We have a small, growing minority of believers. That's why they arrested them and threatened them. They understood what was going on. They understood the spiritual movement. So verse 4 is proof that Yeshua's name could not be contained. But that is a proof before the threats. Remember we said threats try to contain the growth. This was before the threats. But let's look at what happened after their threats. Did that stop the growth of the church after the threats? Let's go to chapter 5. So in chapter 5, the apostles then were released to the public. And this is after they were threatened. They knew the threats of the Sanhedrin, but it didn't stop them from preaching. They were arrested again. And during the second time that they stood before the Sanhedrin, we see whether or not the name of Yeshua was contained by the threats of the enemy. Was it contained? Let's read verses 27 to 28 of chapter 5. It says, And when they had brought them, they set, so they, they being the religious leaders, when they had brought the apostles, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Does this sound like Yeshua's name was contained by the threats? Absolutely not. Instead of containing Yeshua's name and not letting it spread any further, the opposite happened. It filled all of Jerusalem. The doctrine, the teaching of Yeshua. These religious leaders, they understood what was going on. They understood the threat to their status quo. And they were threatened because they were supposed to be the teachers. That was their responsibility. Instead, the apostles were the ones filling Jerusalem with their doctrine, the doctrine of Yeshua. So their words indicate that they couldn't contain the name of Yeshua from spreading and filling all of Jerusalem. Why was this happening? Why couldn't Yeshua's name be contained? Why did they have such a hard time with that? And I want to close by just giving you three reasons why the name cannot be contained. Number one, the gospel message, the message about Yeshua is a blameless message. Yeshua was blameless, and the message of salvation through him is a blameless message. What do I mean by that? I mean it's without fault. It's a perfect message. The Sanhedrin couldn't prevent the spread of the name of Yeshua because his message was without fault. It's hard to convince people to stop following Yeshua if they can't prove that he's wrong or he's guilty of something. Remember, that's what they tried to do leading up to his crucifixion. They tried to find Yeshua guilty of something because if they can find this perfect Messiah guilty of breaking the law, then people will stop following him. It's the same thing with the message of the gospel through Yeshua. People want to find fault with it so that people will not follow and believe in it. But they couldn't do that. They were trying to do it. Here we see the Sanhedrin trying to accuse them of something that they broke the Jewish law. And I think it's possible they tried to use Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13 may have been the basis for their accusation. Let's, turn, let's put your finger here, just quickly go to Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13 is the test of a, basically a false prophet. And if someone was proven to be a false prophet, Deuteronomy 13, then he was to be rejected and also to be stoned. Let's just read Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 5. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives thee a sign or a wonder... And the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. 
Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proves you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil way from the midst of thee. If they could prove that they were false prophets and leading them away from the true God to a false God, he would be guilty of breaking the law. And I think it might have been Deuteronomy 13, because that's the same thing the Jews are trying to say today about believers, right? When they say you, you believe in Yeshua, they, they say you believe in another God. You say he's God, so Yeshua is another God. This may have been what the Sanhedrin was trying to prove. That these men who did this miracle, they're trying to turn you to Jesus, to this, this name Yeshua. And it's a false God, that's what they're trying to say. The miracle was clearly done, and the apostles were attributing it to Yeshua. So they tried to accuse them of directing them to a false God, but they failed. Verses 14 to 16, let's read those again. Beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Verses 14 to 16. Yeah, back to Acts 4. So this lame man, this lame man is now walking. He's clear proof. He's standing there. So as they're interrogating Peter and John, the lame man is also standing next to them. He was living proof. And so we see their words in verses 14. They could say nothing against it. And in verse 16, we cannot deny it. We can't deny or say anything against what has happened. And it's the same thing when they're presented with the truth of Yeshua. This was just a reflection, a proof of Yeshua. Again, Yeshua is true and blameless. He's without fault. And the gospel of salvation through Yeshua is just as true and blameless. When we preach the gospel, no one can truly deny it. Sure, they can personally reject it. But they can't prove that it's wrong, that it's broken the law. They could even try to do that. But the reality is they can't. Therefore, it's hard to contain something that you can't point a fault into it and dissuade other people from following it. That's the number one reason why it can't be contained in these two chapters. Second reason, that his name can't be contained because believers are compelled. The ones that follow Yeshua, they have this inner urge to speak about Yeshua. Verses 19 and 20, what was their response? What was Peter and John's response when they were threatened? But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We cannot but speak about Yeshua. Great men in the Bible all have this same quality, this inner Maybe compulsion is the word to speak about their Lord. This inner desire, it's like they can't not speak about their Lord. Peter and John said, we cannot but speak. We must speak. We must speak about Yeshua. You can threaten us. You can forbid us. But we feel within ourselves deep down that we have no other choice but to speak about Yeshua. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Peter and John shared a similar desire with many great men of the Bible. Let's just look at two of them. There's these two men who speak so beautifully about this deep inner desire to speak about their Lord. Jeremiah. Jeremiah, he knows a bit about what Peter and John were going through. Jeremiah chapter 20. 
Jeremiah went through a lot of stuff with the people of Israel. He really suffered. And it seemed like he was getting worn down. Maybe tired of rebuking others with the word, knowing they were going to not accept it. Tired of their mockery and persecution just for speaking for the Lord. We read in chapter 20 that he's describing these emotions, that he almost wanted to stop preaching. That he wanted to keep quiet. But we see that because of this inner desire, the feeling that we must speak of the Lord, he couldn't keep quiet. It's why it's hard to spread, stop the spread of the name of the Lord. The people that truly believe in him are compelled to speak. Let's read how Jeremiah puts it. Let's read verses 7 to 9. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. So we see some of the discouragement. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. Would you want to be in Jeremiah's position? For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. He was in a state of despair. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But, but he could not. His word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He wanted to keep quiet because of all he was suffering for speaking about the Lord. But he couldn't keep his mouth shut because he had this burning fire inside of him that as much as he wanted to repress it and keep it from coming out, he couldn't. This, this verse is saying he, he literally couldn't keep that desire down. Couldn't repress it. Couldn't hold it in. And it's because believers share this desire that the name of Yeshua can't be contained. If every believer has this burning desire, they can't keep their mouth shut about Yeshua. So his name spreads no matter what the threats are, no matter what the discouragement was for Jeremiah, no matter how often people disrespected him and hurt him. Paul says it this way. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. Verse 16. First Corinthians 9, 16. What does Paul say? For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Does that not sound like a man who has this same burning fire inside of him that even if he wanted to suppress it, we don't really see Paul wanting to suppress it, but even if he wanted to, he could not, it was necessary, he felt, to speak. Do we have that same desire? Do we find it a necessity to speak of our Lord? It wasn't just something that Paul felt like doing. He felt like it was a necessity. It was a daily part of his life. Just as he had to get up and drink and eat, he needed to preach about Yeshua. Can I, can all of us, join these men with this inner desire of speaking for our Lord? Are we, as we say in English, bursting at the seams to just to tell people about Yeshua? We can't hold it in. It can't be contained even with inside of us. Yeshua's name can't be contained. And one of those reasons, because us as believers are so compelled, this inner fire that just has to come out to speak about Yeshua. When all the believers feel like this, it's impossible to contain the message of Yeshua. One final thing, his name can't be contained because God is behind it all. God's in control. He's the one making sure that Yeshua's name spreads. In chapter 5, back in Acts, let's go back to Acts chapter 5, the apostles again were standing before the Sanhedrin, and 
This time they're really angry. The Sanhedrin's ready to kill them. But there's a man that stands up to reason with them within the Sanhedrin called Gamaliel, a man that's believed to have influence over the Apostle Paul. And so he steps in and gives this reason. Chapter 5, let's read verses 34 to 39. Then stood, up there, then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And said unto them, You men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. Again, they wanted to kill them. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the, of, the, of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. Gamaliel gives a simple argument here. He says there were other men that came and said they were the Messiah. Men such as Thutis and Judas of Galilee. But these men both died. And what happened after they died? Their followers scattered and they stopped following. They didn't, they didn't spread the name of Thutis. They didn't spread the name of Judas of Galilee. So if Yeshua is just another man like these two men, the result's going to be the same. They'll stop talking about Yeshua. We don't need to worry about his name spreading any further. However, if the message they preach, if what they're preaching about Yeshua is true, if it's from God, if it be of God is what he says in verse 39, then there's nothing you can do about it anyways. If it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. In other words, to say it in our modern terms, if God's in it, it will be accomplished. There's absolutely no way to contain it from spreading. If, you, if God wants Yeshua's name to spread, which he does, then it will spread. Your threats aren't going to do anything. Just let them go. And we're here, what, 2,000 years later? <laughs> Nobody's talking about Thutis and Judas of Galilee. Yet millions are talking about Yeshua. They're putting faith in him for their salvation. His name cannot be contained. We have enemies of the gospel. And what we say about Yeshua may grieve them or upset them. But we are to preach despite any threats they bring. Despite what feelings it may cause in people. The question is, do we feel compelled to speak about Yeshua? Do we have that inner burning fire like Jeremiah? that says even though he wanted to repress it, he couldn't. And Paul who said... I have to speak. It's of necessity. And like Peter said, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Yeshua's name cannot be contained. God will make sure of that. It's in his hands. But let's do our part by being a faithful proclaimer of the name of Yeshua.